Welcome to My Life Chassidus Applied, episode 502. This program is dedicated by Moshe and Rachel Keller in loving memory of their son Ben Sian Berl, who graced our lives with 17 years of joy and left us with an everlasting smile. So we are in the last week of Sivan, the month of Sivan, the third month of the year, counting from when the Eden, the Jews left Mitzrayim, the month of Matan Teda, and we're going into from Sivan into Tammuz next week. So let's talk about the time period which we're in, as well as the Parsha, Parsha's Kedach. What does this time period and Teda portion teach us today? And we know we have our challenges. We have plenty of challenges. We have the war continuing, unfortunately, in Gaza, north of Israel. Eretz Yisrael and Eden in general under attack. No surprises. But did we expect this? No. We thought it was really all over and we marched right into the Geula. But we still have these challenges that we need to address. But we don't come unarmed. We come with an arsenal, an arsenal that goes back thousands of years of Teda, Teda Hashem, that gives God, giving us guidance and direction, strength and power, courage and fortitude, and resilience and resolve to get through all of this. And come out stronger than ever. And vice days, for mysterious reasons, we don't know why, there needs to be some final gasp of the negative energy in this world. The Rebbe made it very clear, put him tough Shemem Zayin, when he spoke so strongly that we're mamish at the threshold, we're literally at the threshold of Geula. So why are there still some things that happen that are negative? And he said, that as truth emerges, things have to become clear. So sometimes you have those last gasps of the adversity our adversaries of the negative forces that reveal their head, their ugly heads, better than them being concealed, so we can then cut off those heads and eliminate it once and for all. So clearly we're going through some stage of that nature. But as I said, we come with great tremendous strength. And each time period has its unique strength. Each week has its energy, the energy of the week the Parsha in the week, the days, the special days. So what do we have for us this week that gives us strength? And every week it's another energy. This week we have in the calendar, it's the powerful day of Chof Ches Sivan, 28th of Sivan. We're talking about the day when the Rebbe and the Rebbetzin came to America, barely saved from the last ship out of Portugal, Chav Chesiv, they arrived at these shores, 1941. So we're talking about now, we're talking about 80, 83 years, 1941. Now we're in 2024. Right. <clears throat> so when we think of it that way, Tov Shem Pei Dalet, Tov Shem Aleph. 83 years. Friedrich Rebbe came to the United States a year before, a little more than a year before, in Tessa Adesheni, Tovshin, middle of World War II. So when you think of this day, at a very basic level, on one hand, it's a day of Hatzalah, saved from the claws of the Nazis who were then overrunning Europe, had occupied France where the Rebbe and the Rebbetzin lived, so it's a tremendous day, saved their lives, but it's much more than that. It was the day, as the Rebbe writes in the notes on Chof Ches Siva, whenever describing that day, it's a day when a new tnufa, a new era, a new stage of spreading Torah and Chassidus began with the establishment of the Moses that the Friedrich Rebbe established under, this, under the leadership of his son-in-law, the Rebbe. Nine years later, the Rebbe would assume the leadership, Tav Shin Yud, Tav Shin Yud Aleph, of after the Istalkus of the Friedrich Rebbe. So it was very turbulent times. We're talking about the middle of World War II. 
middle of the decimation, the massacres. And yet, the Friedrich Rebbe and the Rebbe in the same spirit made it clear, the Friedrich Rebbe, that we came to America not just to save our lives, but to make this place into a Mokim Teda, a Mokim Tfila, a Mokim Shal Mitzvah, a place of Teda Tfila and Gmilas Chasodim. To bring cities that they would be here just as it was in the old home. America is Nishtandish, America is not different. And indeed, even though at the time some people questioned and were skeptical, indeed he prevailed. Is there more work to be done? Absolutely. But no one can say it didn't happen. This is a leader, a pioneer, a visionary. So Chav Chesn Nissen Sivan gives us tremendous strength and what's possible. And as the Rebbe emphasizes, coming to Chatzik Kader Atachten is as a particular stage, new stage, because Chatzik Kader Atachten, as the Alter Rebbe says, Matan Teda wasn't Chatzik Kader Elyon. And in a letter, the Rebbe asks the Friedrich Rebbe, "What does that mean? Matan Teda was everywhere." He says, "Begoli, it was on the higher hemisphere, the upper hemisphere, where Eretz Yisrael is. The United States is the lower hemisphere. What does, sign- what does it signify spiritually?" That's a darker tachtenim. Talk about the dira betachtenim. In tachtenim itself, there's the chetzikadar elyon, chetzikadar natachten. And when you want to pick up a building, you have to pick it up from the bottom. So before Yidin settled, Jews settled in America, in this hemisphere, the, the objective was, the hope was, that the Aveda would be intense enough that the light would spread. And you wouldn't have to come to this part of the world. The light of Teir and Mitzvah would draw like a powerful torch, the sparks, even in the Chatzikah As the Alter Rebbe explains similarly in the beginning of Teir Eir, the Alter Rebbe explains that essentially that's how it would have been had other Machavah not eaten from the tree of knowledge. So you could be in your place and with the powerful light that you're generating, draw all the sparks, the 288, from all over the world. But when you don't do that, you have to now go find those sparks. And essentially the transmigration and the population growth of human beings is essentially, since you didn't finish the job, now we didn't finish the job, of drawing those sparks, we have to now go find those sparks. That's what the Aved Lamata Lamayla, in a sense, two thousand was in the Rebbe said, Chav Ches Nisan Tav Shinun Aleph. that we have to do everything we can to draw and find those sparks, not draw them from the top down, but from the bottom up. So this day, Chav Ches Sivan, signifies that type of Aveda. And indeed, what happened as the years passed, we see America and then the rest of the world, Shluchim and Shluch is sent to building institutions and building organizations and schools and shuls and bring Yichsidus to every corner of the world. The way the Rebbe puts it, Vayeshev Tav Shinun Beis, in a way that it should be Mitziyusi Matzmuse, the language of the Alter Rebbe, Simen Geras HaKedosh Simachov, of the Yesh, Mitziyusi Matzmuse, meaning not just you're bringing light from somewhere else, but every place becomes a Merkis, as the Rebbe said, becomes a center that generates light. Momata Lamayla, Aveda Bekeach Atzmi, ultimate birr. So on a day like this, we get tremendous power, Chav Ches Sivan. No matter what challenge we have, we know we can overcome. And it's interesting, it began right in the middle of World War II, the darkest of times. So as we recreate that energy this week, it applies to the challenges we have in Eretz Yisrael, in Gaza, in the north, wherever there may be some darkness, there may be some challenge. Here's a day that says you can go into Chatzik Kadra Tachten, a place where Matan Teda was not in a revealed way. A place where Jews did not settle for many thousands of years. But with the power of Teda Mitzvahs and with the power of previous generations, we now come and we can transform and elevate this Tachten, Kutzikadra Tachten, and in the process elevate the entire world. That's the lesson. One of the lessons. It's also Pasha Kedach. So what do we learn from Parshas Kedach? That's what we learned from Chav Ches Sivan. What do we learn from Parshas Kedach? So if you think about it, Kedach challenged 
the very leadership of Moshe Rabbeinu and Aaron. Kol Eidik Deshem Him, he argued. The entire people, the entire community are holy, are sacred. Maduatis Nasu. Why are you lifting yourself up higher than everyone? He challenged the very idea of leadership. Everybody is equal. And this was a grave sin. He had intentions, and we'll talk about that shortly. But the bottom line, what does it teach us? The affirmation of Moshe Rabbeinu. Because then Moshe turns to Hashem, Hashem says, we'll make a sign, and finally it's established that God did choose Moshe and did choose Aaron. Kairach was making an important point. It's true, every neshama is holy, but we need guidance and we need leadership. And that's the role of a Rebbe. Kairach was challenging the role of a Rebbe. It's not surprising, therefore, that Gimel Tammuz, 30 years ago, which we'll talk about and dedicate next week's program to, was Mitzvah Shabbos Kairach, the challenge to a Rebbe. And indeed, it was a challenge, Gimel Tammuz, where the sun stopped, Pnei Moshe, Pnei Chama. Face of Moshe is like the face of the sun. Shem is given then, and the sun stops. But Kedach was t- totally wrong. That, oh, every one of us, Kedeshim Him, we are holy, but we need a leader, we need leaders to show us the way, to guide us. which of course is tremendously relevant today. Because as we face our challenges, as I discussed before, the Friedrich Rebbe and then the Rebbe, Achav Ches Sivan, the Friedrich Rebbe earlier, gave us guidance, direction, instructions, and established us to be shluchim and shluchis wherever we go in the world. And we need that koyach. We need that power. So koyach is a challenge, but at the same time then an affirmation that we need a Rebbe more than ever. And it's with that strength that we can march forward to the Geula and overcome and actually transform every liability, every challenge into an opportunity. So that's the short answer, what we learned from Parshas Kedach. But then let's go into some more details that people have asked. What lessons do we derive from the Kedach episode about leadership and uniting under one leader? And how to unite under one true leader in order to prevail during today's era of war and unrest. So here's the challenge. On one hand, like you said, call it Everybody has a chelik alikam mamash, has a divine soul. And as such is unique and has direct link and direct connection to God. On the other hand, we have differences. Ain parts of and shavis. Our faces are not the same. Ain deyase and shavis. Our opinions are not the same. We have many differences. How do we bring these two together? Create a harmony within diversity. That's what Kedach fell short. And that, the answer to that is bittal. We don't annihilate the individuality of our, our individuality, and we don't, God forbid, annihilate, of course, our unity. So how do we bring them together? Will we go beyond our egos, and we realize that we are all indispensable components of, think of it, of one large musical symphony. Each one needed absolutely. And each one needing the other. And that's where the Neshama Klolis, the all-inclusive collective soul of a Rebbe, comes into play because it brings them both together. Think of a human body. Human body has they say close to 35 to 75 trillion cells. Trillion. Thousands of systems. Many limbs and organs. I mean, the list goes on. In a healthy body, they all work together. There's some conductor. So we know the mind is like the central nervous system. So how does that play itself out in people? The same idea. You could have 8 billion people. Or more. But there's a conductor. There's a neshama clothes. Like everything originates from Odom Arishin. He was considered the first collective soul. And then the leaders, Moshe Rabbeinu and the Moshe in each generation. So what is their role? Their role is to combine the two. Not to, God forbid, compromise the individual, 
but to make sure that the individual, like a conductor, all work together in coordinated fashion. Each one complementing the other, each one necessary. We'll soon discuss what was Kedach, the root of his mistake. But that's what we end up learning from this week's chapter. So what do we derive? The idea of having that one, like there's a one, one Koyen Gadol, there's one Moshe Rabbeinu, there's one Teir, there's one Ebrister. That un- unity, that, u- that oneness, however, permeates the individuals. We see Hashem Yishma Yisrael, Hashem Elkeinu, Hashem Echad. Echad is one, but it's made up of three letters. Aleph, the Aleph of Aluf Shalel, the master of the universe, the Aleph of oneness. Ches is seven heavens and earth. And Dalad are the four directions, north, south, or east, west, north, south. So the unity is permeating, transforming, saturating the individuality. So when you say a healthy body, do you say your body is made up of 75 trillion parts? Or hundreds of limbs and organs? No, it's one person. That person is comprised of all many details. Same thing with nature. The symbiosis, the fascinating synchronicity of existence is marvels, it blows the mind. Everyone marvels at it when we look at it. Even in one species, let alone the entire world. How it all works together. So in a time of war, and time of challenge, that's what you need most. Look at how it is even in physical military. How important it is to have a hierarchy, a chain of command, and listen to orders. Why is a court-martial so intense and so serious? Because it puts so many other people in danger if there isn't a chain of command. It's life and death. And you need to receive an order, you have to follow the order. You can't question it. And the one who ordered it gets his orders from above him, all the way going back to the commander-in-chief. And the most for that is that Rebbe uses this example when he speaks to the children. Commander in chief is the Abish, the Melech Malchem Amloch Makodesh Baruchum, Melech Atzvoyis, the Sikh and Tovshim Amalaf. The Rebbe spoke to children, one of the first Sikhs, the second, uh, Hanukkah was two Sikhs then. So the, the second Sikh, the Rebbe asked us actually to find all the sources that the Abish refers, referred to commander in chief. So there's a footnote there in the second Sikh, I think it's a Sikh Hanukkah Sikh. Toshim Amal, if you can find that. I believe it's printed uh, his office to look at the Chelik. That would be uh, Hanukkah time. Chelik uh, Chof. Volume 20. So the commander in chief is the unifying force, but you need all the departments and all the parts of the military. You need the Navy, you need the Air Force, you need the infantry, the army. And they work together and they all coordinate with each other. That's an example. So the harmony within diversity, especially in a time of challenge, where there could be different opinions and there could be danger, more danger, and you need very clear orders. Kedach, Vispalik Kedach says, the Neum HaLemelech, of the Targum, the Neum HaLemelech explains, Vayikach Kedach, Vayikach Vispalik, he separated. He created Pirud, separation. So even though he said, Kol Deshimim, yes, that's true. But what's the unifying force? How do they all unite and coordinate with each other? That's the Moshe and the Ad and the leaders that Hashem established. So now more than ever, we need to look to our leaders. And what are the, how do we look to our leaders? Through the Tata that they taught us, the directives they gave us. That's what unifies us all and teaches us all to do our role, our unique role in this battle. And we all have our roles. Some people fight in certain areas, some in others, some are intelligence, some are in communication, some are in administration. There's the physical part of the war, the spiritual part of the war. Okay, next question. Now, after this challenge came to Moshe, Moshe turns to Hashem, Hashem says, I saw a sign of who I chose to be leaders. And he asks everybody to produce rods, and whoever's will sprout into almonds by the morning will know that's who Hashem chose. So question at, one questioner asks, 
What is the significance of Aaron's rod sprouting almonds to prove he was the best candidate to be the high priest of Kohen Gadol? I mean, Hashem could have just said, I want Aaron. Why does it have to come through this type of miracle? A sign. So one of the explanations why almonds, almonds are the quickest developing plant there is, or fruit or nut. It takes 21 days for an arm to blossom. The blessings of God that come to us go through many channels. We want it to be the fastest way to get to us. That's why you have kahanim. One of the roles of kahanim is birchus kahanim. They bring us the blessings, yuvarecha, Hashem v'yishmarecha, and so on. Ad meheri yoretz dvari. In a speedy way. Because due to the, st- the channels, so to speak, and filters and regulators of the cosmic order, it could take time till it gets to us. And not just time, physical time, but also different impediments. That's why you can have a blessing above, but something is blocking it. So you want those leaders, the Kayanim, to be the ones that make sure it comes, and as quickly as possible. You know, think of an example. The heart can be very healthy, but you want to make sure the fuel lines, the arteries, are not clogged and not blocked. And they allow the blood to circulate freely and flow, and flow smoothly. So that's why Hashem said, let it be through the sprouting of our almonds. To show and demonstrate the speed of the blessings. Almond also something that grows. It's not just that it grows, it makes other things grow. So all that's part of the symbolism behind the almonds. And growth also demonstrates a healthy perpetuation. It's not a selfish thing. You make things grow. Your blessings are not just about you and your power. Kedach wanted power. Perhaps for good intentions, but he still wanted power. It's not about power. This is about making others grow, making the blessings of God manifest and make things sprout and grow. Okay. Why did Kedach want to be the high priest? Someone asks. So we have different explanations. You look in Rashi, you look in commentaries. And some say his mistake, because he was a pikachoya. He was a wise, sharp man. And the Helik Kedishner once said about Kedach, the Helik Kedishner Kedach. He was a levi. So Kedach was not some uh, pushover. He was a serious person. And he had Yichus, and he was connected, the cousin of, of Moshe Rabbeinu, and Adon. And he just said, Kol so what do you mean? Why do you want to be Kayin God? So the simple explanation is because he wanted to be a leader, but not as a leader, not to encourage everyone to be a leader in their own right. Here he was arguing, they took the leadership. That's exclusive to them. But there's the deeper explanation that's brought them Mepharshim and brought them Chassidus as well. That Kedach saw the future. In the future, it says in the Novi, in the book of Yechaskel, the Levim Yukanim, the Levim will be Kehanim. Kedach, being a wise person, Ezu Chacham Areyas Anelet, saw the future as, and saw the vision that the Levim will be Kehanim. So he was saying, that's a fulfillment of myself. The language of Chsidis, why? Levim are Gvura, Kehanim are Chesed. So even though chesed comes before gvura, chesed is love, gvura is discipline, but the root of gvura, sheresh gvura is higher than chesedim. The power to discipline, to withhold, is rooted deeper than the power to give. But not today. Today gvuras have to be nimtak, meaning sweetened and tamed by the by chesedim. Gvura is like a makabel. Chesed is mashpia. La'osid lavi, once the world will be refined, the very yesh itself, the Makabal itself, like the moon, will become even greater than the sun. The soul will be nurtured and sustained from the body. But that's the of it. Today it needs the guidance. Chesed has to be the one that guides Gvura. That was Kedach's big mistake. So someone asks a question. There are many commentaries that say during the time of Shia that Kedach will be the Kohen God. I don't know about many, I know the commentary, I believe that Amem Epanoi in the Sefer Asura Mamora says that. 
What, why would Hashem reward the sub, insubordinate psychophant Korach, who caused pain and suffering to Moshe Rabbeinu with such an honor to be Kohen Gadol? Who will be on this... Who will be on the Sanhedrin during Mashiach time? Tosin and Avira? Who will be the general of the army? Esav? Kairuch was punished for a good reason. Why would he be rewarded? Okay, very good questions. Because remember, Kairuch was, was wrong because now is not the time. Now the Mekech has to be under the guidance of Chesed. And who's Esha Chesed, the Kayin, Arna Kayin? With Kerach and Levim being Gvura. Without, if you don't have that guidance, look, let's talk technically, psychologically. Even though at times you need to discipline a child, a student, but what's Gvura without Chesed? It can bring to the worst, Yenika Sachetzerim, to the worst type of things. Even if it's coming from a holy place, intentions can end up being cruel, hurtful, abusive. That's why the Elam. You mean mekareves or smel decha? With a strong you mean chesed mekareves, and even when there's smile, it's with the yada smile. Even when there's with the need for gvura, with the yada smile, it's decha. To be decha, it's only with the yad kaya, with the weaker arm. Lost love, the world will be pure. There'll be no room for chetzenim. So gvura is going to be pure gvura tikdusha. Like we talk about simsum, the simsum comes from gvura. And then, Shem Elikim. It's the name of God. But it's Hepacharotzin. The whole purpose of the Tzimtzum is Bishrila Gili. Lassadav will reveal that the whole, what the meaning of Tzimtzum is. Because Tzimtzum on its own can appear like darkness. It can appear like withholding, refraining. The famous story of the Moshe of Rabbi Hill Parcha in the three weeks. The teacher wants to reveal a deeper revelation to the student, but he falls silent. The silence can be misunderstood. It's really deeper chesed. Because in order to conceal, you need to have even more strength than to reveal. Hein heng But that will be revealed loss of loving. Today, gvoreis have to be very much controlled and tamed and sweetened by the by So, So, Kedich's mistake is we're not in a world yet like that. Where the gvoreis can rise above the levim, above the kahan. But loss of loving, point that I remember Pano, when things will be aligned, you can say that Kedach, or Gilgal of Kedach, however it's explained, will have that element because ultimately it will be revealed how the Levim are Kayanim. <clears throat> Why did Kedach want to be high priest? So the Rebbe has a beautiful sikh, I believe it's in Tov Shin Nun Aleph, Kedach, where the Rebbe brings that the Rambam, at the end of Hilch Shmita Vievel, says, Le Shevet Levi Bulvad, not just Shevet Levi alone. But every person who's, who, who separates himself from the materialism and the pettiness of this world, has a miskadish case and dedicates himself to God, is miskadish kedush kedoshim. And he brings a posting on Yehi Hashem Chelkecha Benachloscha from Parsha Kedach. The Rebbe asked, "Lochele the posting is the hypech because Kedach did it the wrong way." So he said, "No, Kedach's intentions were the right thing. Every person should want to be a Kain God." But he did it the wrong way, with the wrong, with the wrong method. He didn't do it with Bittl. When you do it with Bittl, every person should be like the Rambam says. But you still do not negate the deed for having the direction and guidance of the leaders. That's explained in that sikh. <coughs> What's the story with Dosan and Aviram? So Dosan and Aviram are the troublemakers, as we know. But interestingly, they came out of Mitzrayim. They weren't like those that died in Mitzrayim, even though they kept on instigating to go back to Mitzrayim. So the Maral and others say, the Asnavirim is like the Zalumas of Moshe and Adam. And finally, as they show their true face here in the story with Kedach, they are ultimately swallowed up. But like all Zalumas, they have a role to play. And we have to learn from that as well. That's briefly, not so much to go into more detail. Good. What do we learn from the Haftar of the Kedach? So somebody wrote this in the Haftar of Pasha's Kedach, we read, or we read about the prophet Shmuel gathering the community together to coronate King Shaul. 
Shmuel asked Hashem to send her a severe th- thunderstorm as a sign to prove Saul was the correct candidate to be king. Then the people complained to Shmuel about the bad weather and asked him to daven to Hashem to end the thunderstorm. And Shmuel asked Hashem, and Hashem then removed the thunderstorm and made it a nice day out. First of all, this story proves something that anti-Semites say, that the Jews control the weather. More importantly, if we do have the power to control the weather with our davening, what specific prayer should we be saying to ask Hashem to remove the devastating and deadly heat wave and restore the rest of the summer to a more manageable and enjoyable 70 degrees? Thank you. Okay, (laughs) that surprised me a bit. It's all about weather. I think there's a deeper story here going on than just the weather. You know, Hashem should bless us with good weather and all that thing, but the fact is everything has its role to play, including thunderstorms. But talk about this Avteira and talk about this whole story. In Berch Mitzvah Secha, Mitzvah Smine Melech, or Sefer HaMitzvah, as the Rabbeim call the Sefer, talks about, based on Alter Rebbe's Maimer, why Shmuel was upset at the Eden and rebuked them when they came to ask for a king. It says, it's a mitzvah, mitzvah, appoint a king. So why did Shmuel say, what do you need a king for? You have Hashem, melech, malchem, melech, makadosh, baruch, God is your king. And finally, when they insisted, Hashem said, give them a king. And that was Shaul. It goes on, King Shaul did not end up being the permanent king, because Malchus is Malchus based David. And he explains there the details. What is the essence of it? And this goes back to the story with Kairach, and that's the connection. Kairach misunderstood the real role of a, re- of a Rebbe, of a leader, is Bittel. That's what he says there. Shmuel sensed that the Eden were asking for a Melech not because of Bittel. They wanted for nationalistic reasons, for pride. Every nation has a king. We want a king too. As most people would say, a king, power, wealth, control, opulence. Na, 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 says the Tzemach Tzedek. A king is Malchus. David was a bad Nafli, didn't have any years of his own. Complete bittle. That why, we, why do we need a king when there's Hashem? Because the king serves as a role model of what it means to be completely nullified. So it teaches us how to be nullified before God. We know there's no, only God is king. Why is a human being serving as a king that we have to obey? It's not about him. Complete bittle. He's here to bring bittle and reveal the kola edek deshim him in each one of us. Shaul had an element of that, but Shaul was Bina, like he explains. Ultimate Malchus was Dovid HaMelech, as he explains in that Maimur. So there's different stages. Maybe that's connected. He doesn't say there's the thunderstorms. Thunderstorm is a, uh, is a type of like disruptive state because it was hard to break in this idea of a Melech. But ultimately, it was broken in and then prepared the ground for the real king that forever would be Dovid Melech. David, David HaMelech, Malchus Beis David, for David the Avid the David Nosil Hem Laelam, all the way to Mashiach Ben David. Okay. One final question that's connected with last week's parsha: How do we explain why the Jews so readily received the Torah, but opposed entering the Promised Land incited by the scouts, by the Meraglim? When Hashem offered us the Torah, we had so much betochen in Hashem, trust in Hashem, that we said, Nasev Nishma, even before knowing all the details in the Torah, we'll do and then we'll hear or understand. But in contrast, when Hashem said it's time to leave the desert and go into the land of Israel that I will show you, all of a sudden there was resistance and we said, we're not so sure, this is a good idea, let's send Imaragdim first. Why didn't we say Nasev Nishma, also to Hashem's idea of entering Israel? How did our betochen disappear so quickly? So essentially, I answered this question last week, but I'll go over it again. Shlach l'chol is what Hashem said to Moshe. Because yes, there's the things that are gili mumayla, like matan teira, Hashem gives it to us, and we just accept the gift. But then there's the biru hav tachtenim, we spoke before by chatzik kadar tachten, that has to come from the bottom up. That's why l'daytacha. Don't just say, because I don't just rely on me, my brachas. As the Ramban explains, prepare yourself. Scout out where the strong points, where the weak points, what does the enemy look like? To prepare the ground. But obviously it's with God's kreches and God's strengths and resources and blessings. 
So it was not the sending of the scouts was not lack of betachon, it was actually fulfilling God's commandment. Their mistake was that the, like, the, the problem was not whether to, the, 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 to go and scout out the land. That was how to conquer the land. Their mistake was they came to a conclusion we can't do it. That's not acceptable. That's Takanas of Anishma. Hashem said you're going to go into the promised land. That's Nas. We would must do that. How? Benishma, we figure out how. But it's only a how. We don't question whether we can or not. That's briefly the answer. Okay. Let's move on to some other questions. Some controversial questions, some timely ones. And let's try to get through this. So next question, how should we react to the Israeli court ruling to force Haredim to join, to be drafted into the army? The army the IDF. How should we react, someone writes, to Israel changing its laws to force Haredim to join the army? I understand the need for manpower during a war, but wouldn't it be more dangerous to draft people who have no interest in serving in the army? It might be better idea, a better idea to get more mind power by hiring a mercenary army like the Russian Wagner Group or the Blackwater Group and send them into Gaza. Another person writes, Shalom of Rachel Rabbi Jacobson. The following question is one of the issues that is, that is bringing division amongst our people at a time when Ahdus is paramount. The question is, what does the Rebbe say about who should serve in the Israeli army? Of course, I am addressing the role of yeshiva students in serving in an army that for argument's sake is kosher in terms of the mixing of men and women, etc. May the time of the final redemption arrive when there will be no war anymore. May my akaras atev to your aveda to bringing Mashiach now. To bring Mashiach now. Okay. So this is a powerful question, a very relevant question. Let me present it with several, several different angles here. First thing we need to know, I'll share a story, a story that happened with my father-in-law. He was in the United States. He came in 1947. 1948 was the War of Independence. And that's just so. His father writes to his son, who's a bochrin yeshiva, your blood is not more valuable than the blood of your two brothers who are in Israel, and they're going to fight in this war. Obviously, he asked the Rebbe. So he wrote and he asked the Friedrich Rebbe a question, what to do. Friedrich Rebbe responded that who is an arik, who is a deserter in time of war, not someone who is not fighting, someone who leaves his position. If someone, for example, is in the communications and says he wants to fight on the front line, that's not acceptable. They need you in that position. Someone who's an intelligence, someone who's uh, doing some other role, Everyone has their role. Someone's in the Air Force, they're not in the Navy. The Navy, not in the, the, in the Army. Your job in this war is to sit and learn Tata where you are and to do it with a full dedication. That's your job. Leaving that position, that's being a deserter. What does this tell us? This is not some ptur, some exemption. You're, you're exempt from the military. You're never exempt. We're all part of the war. We all know a Jewish war has always been fought on a physical front and a, and a spiritual front. Yeshua led the war against Amalek and Moshe Rabbeinu was praying to Hashem. Kept his hands up. David, uh, Yeyev, the commander-in-chief in the time of David HaMelech, was leading the commander-in-chief of the, the war and David was saying to him and praying. But that's predicated that everybody feels drafted and mobilized. Not someone says, oh, you know what, I'm exempt, it's someone else's problem. And I could sleep till 11 o'clock and eat falafel and shawarma and twiddle my thumbs or other nonsense. No, 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 that's not acceptable. Unfortunately, this message is not clearly spelled out. Many secular people, many not secular people, even religious people, don't see it that way. They say the religious found this exemption. That in the beginning when the state was established, Ben Gurion left them alone, either because he needed something from them or whatever the reason was. It's not the case. We're all part of this war. 
And yes, in a time of war, what we should be announcing, the yeshivas should be saying that our students are waking up 5 o'clock in the morning exactly the same time the soldiers on the front lines are waking up. And they're climbing three up, up rough, uh, wet mountains with 300 pounds on their back. Or whatever other danger they're going into, that these students are learning with milcham tishaltera, with exertion, with sweat and tears and their blood spiritually for this war. Hashkin v'hadiv, v'hem kolim me'aleim. They're waking up early, learning teda, and that helps eliminate the enemy. Me'pi'elim v'yemkim yisada ta'ez, even babies. Nursing babies, from their mouths. Yisada ta'ez, e'nez ala teda, they're saying teda, l'hash b'seva misnakim. To tame, to subdue, to conquer the enemies, our enemies. That's the message. If everyone in Etzis Saul knew that, including the courts, and they saw that, it's a whole different story. So now, under the circumstances, what do you do now? You have a yeshiva system. A lot of it is, is political and corrupt, let's be honest. They're getting millions and millions of dollars from the government, and they have these exemptions. And when they're part of the coalition, it puts even more pressure. So if we had it the right way, everyone would understand this need for both parts. Now that we have it this way, what do you, who do you blame here? Obviously, there are some people, anti-religious people in the court system and Israel that are just to dislike the religious. And one of the reasons is because the religious have given them plenty of reason to dislike. I'm not blaming the religious people. I think we're all in this together. We're one family. So the real solution is to get back as one family and try to explain to each other. But the problem right now is a real problem. There is a war being fought. And people will say, one second, why, why are you sitting in your shalim on Bnei Brak or wherever you may be? And we're protecting you. We, our young men are dying. Why aren't you part of this? So in Chabad in general, the Rebbe Taki, there were people who went to war and they're, they, and they're right now part of the military and they're then that danger. The only reason there should be an exemption would be, as I said, because the war is being fought on another front. So I don't have a solution to this because as Israel becomes more and more a percentage of Israeli young will be from Eden. What do you do then when 50% of the population is Israeli? You say it's not our problem, someone else's problem. So that's definitely going to have to be addressed. And keep in mind also that in the Frum world, they do also tremendous things. You have Zaka, Mogen Adom. You have plenty of services that are serving in the uh, military, helping the military, including chaplains, and we're talking about the different organizations that provide food and sustenance and spiritual needs and tefillin and mezuzahs which is part of the morale of the soldiers, all that has to be all taken into account. So I don't have a solution, so my the reaction is, it's a mixed reaction. On one hand, I understand the point that the court is making. On the other hand, I also know that these courts and some of the judges have their own agenda. So it's like everything has a mixture of certain truths and certain things are not completely uh, f- with, full, uh, the, with the right integrity. So this is where we have to put our heads together. But my real solution would be Let's bring it back. We're one family. And we're all part of this battle. No, it's not like you're doing it and we're sitting in our own comfort zones, in our own <coughs> restaurants or homes, doing Shabbos and Yom Tov. We're in it together. And the more we can do that, the more we will solve this problem. And the rift, which is so much part of it. If, imagine the rift wasn't there. Imagine we could talk like we're talking brothers and sisters. You don't think we can come up with a solution? When everybody feels we're all in it together, you definitely can. But now it's become politicized, so everyone's going to dig in, and there's going to be people arrested, and there's going to be demonstrations, there's going to be achil Hashem, and all the sad things that come out of these things. What needs to be done is sit down, we're one family, let's figure it out. And take item by item with everybody putting everything on the table. It's the best way I could respond to it. So it's not about going to war about this. It's about resolving it in a way that is in a loving and peaceful way. Okay. Let's move on. And I'd love to hear from your thoughts about this or any other 
ideas, absolutely. We're going to move on to the United States. Since we're talking about Israel, let's talk about the United States. So the presidential debate, how should we, USA president, we know this is a, a year of election year for the next president of the United States, 52nd president. How should we react to the presidential debate, which was last night? Not last night, I'm sorry, which was last week. Um, last night, it was last uh, Wednesday, Wednesday night. How should we react to the presidential debate, one person writes, which was quite pathetic. Millions of people's lives and futures are at stake, and these two guys are arguing like children over who has a better golf, golf score. Okay, that's the way he puts it. Some people are talking about how Biden completely imploded, or exploded, however you want to put it. So this is not about right now the question about who's right and who's wrong, and who won and who lost. How about, should we react to this? How should we react? I'm talking now, obviously, if my life is this applied. This particular person puts it this way. So I want to read it simply because it came in, but I want to say I got quite a few questions. Many of them were impartial. They were not talking pro-Biden or pro-Trump. Some were very pro-Trump and said, look, how could we have a president like this, like Biden, who's basically incoherent and all that we witnessed. So I want to address not what every pundit is talking about in the media, but from a Teir Echsidr's perspective. Let me first read this guy's rant. We have 300 million people in this great country, and the only two choices are between a criminal and a senile old man with dementia. Okay, well, I'm sure there are plenty of people who will take issue with what you just wrote, both from the Biden camp and from the Trump camp. Should we choose the lesser of two evils and pick Trump because even though he is flawed, disgusting person, he seems to be physically healthy and can make coherent decisions and lead, and at least we know what he stands for and what he can, we can expect? Or should we pick Biden and have absolutely no idea what will happen because he's unable to coherently explain his agenda? In other words, would the Torah advise us to choose a path that is more comfortable because we know the road? Or would we be advised to venture into the unknown with all the anxiety connected to not knowing what will happen? So I want to speak about it from a perspective. You know, again, this is my life because it is applied. Politics and debates and, pun- and all the spin doctors or non-doctors that are out there you can hear it's not the purpose of this program to be part of that. And I'm not going to go there. Everybody can make their own judgments. From a Taylor point of view, from a Chesidish point of view, sitting at the feet of the Rebbe for so many years, how did he address these things? He didn't. I don't think the Rebbe ever addressed a presidential debate. Definitely did not address a p- political campaigning. He did speak in Tav Shalom Advar that I remember you Aleph Nissen why it's called running for office. We learned the lesson of Milan Bekedush, Rotz Ledvar Mitzvah. So you can learn from secular politics the idea of running. You don't just walk, you run. Lessons. But it was never stooping on that level and getting immersed in local politics or national politics. Now, of course, the Rebbe understood that leaders are determined by God. So the Rebbe's approach would be, choose the person who is most going to present and advance the cause of God. In the Rebbe's words, that there's an ayin rei of Eizen Shemaz, the education of children, religious freedom, moment of silence, the Sheva Mrs. Breneach. That's the only criteria. Not to get into the polit- politics of it. But it's hard to resist because we are living in a gladiator world of dog eats dog. Literally, everybody wants blood. As a Jew, as a chassid, as a human being, that's a thinking person, we shouldn't be defined by these politics. We should see where can, what can I do to help elect the best president for the cause of the human race. It's not even about any specific policy. It's in general what... Taylor wants of us as human beings. Are these two candidates competent or not? That others are going to have to decide. But you know it says, Parnas lefi hadar. That sometimes the, the, every generation and every community, or Parnas lefi hakol, every community gets the leader it deserves. I once gave a talk about this to people who are anti-Trump a few years ago. 
And I said, remember, every country gets a candidate. People say, how could you have such a candidate? Some will say the same about Biden. Everyone gets what they deserve. So we have to maybe look at ourselves. What kind of candidates are we putting up there if you have an issue with them? And why don't we have candidates that are exemplary that we could say, wow, I really respect now, some will say that about these candidates. Fine, everyone has their opinion. My point is we have to be above the fray and look at it from a Teda Chesidisha perspective. Yes, was it difficult to watch? Many things were difficult there. Again, I'm not going to analyze the debate itself. Everybody knows what would happen. But I'm talking more, what should be our reaction? So our reaction has to be Try to find the best candidate that you think can serve the role. Nobody's going to be perfect. Do we have choices here? We have some choices. I think of it also from the perspective of Israel. The Rebbe also used to tell Israel, always speak about Israel. He said, don't, it's not America that decides Israel's destiny. You decide it. But there's no question that some presidents put more pressure than other pressure. So what will be better for Israel and under these circumstances now, the crisis we're dealing with? So many will talk about Trump's moving the embassy to Jerusalem, the Abraham Accords, and other factors. So that would be the criteria that I would suggest we look at. But again, not to get overly immersed, especially get so caught up in the sensationalism of it and lose sight of what really matters. Think of it this way. How does it affect you and your children? You have little children at home. Do they really care whether Trump or Biden whether well, one was more senile and incoherent and the other one was whatever he was. They don't care about that. They care about love, growing up in a healthy way, confidence, fulfilling their mission in this world. So the another person is wrote, so who should we vote for? So my answer, I just gave my answer for that. Vote for the one that fulfills the mission for which we were created in this world to the best of his ability. And I know some people will quote Reagan. The Rebbe did speak about Reagan probably more positive terms than any other president, even though every president, including Carter, Education Day, he's the one that established and the Rebbe spoke about it. But Reagan, because Reagan had the values, the American values, I remember it vividly when I began to write for Reagan's Tov Shemem, 1980. And then when Reagan was shot, I thought I ever spoke about him, but the idea of Ayn Re of Azen Shamas, respecting this country is built on that all, that there's a creator and gave us, endowed us with rights. And that's what we have to encourage our people to follow the higher order, higher moral order of the Noahide laws, of the Ten Commandments, as the Rebbe writes in some letters. That's the focus, and that's what decides what uh, takes priority. Next question, going back to the war in Gaza, are we doing enough in fighting the spiritual war? Being terrorized from all angles is scary enough, but with all the politics and divide going on in Israel, just seems scarier, as unity gives the Jews strength and shows the enemy we are united. Division equals weakness. It literally seems like we are playing into the games of Hamas to the hands of Hamas, even though we know that ultimately everything comes from Hashem, how can we feel secure that there won't be another Holocaust? God forbid. I don't feel that we are pulling our weight in terms of fighting the spiritual war, and even if I personally am doing what I can spiritually, most people are not. So will we ultimately suffer, Chaz Rashaun? What is the Torah's perspective, the Rebbe's perspective? What can we do to feel connected to Hashem and trust in Hashem and feel secure that we are safe and we will win this war? I appreciate your candidness, and I'm sure many people feel in their hearts this trepidation, this question. From the Rebbe, we learned constantly absolute confidence. You look at the Sikha Tov Shen Chov Zayin, Lag Ba'emer. And it was dangerous times then. They were preparing for the worst in Israel, digging mass graves. And the Rebbe said, the Ibish is watching over this land, and our men, women, and children will protect them. And we have to have complete betochen. We cannot succumb to any fear and weakness. Obviously, we have to be prudent and do whatever we do to fight the war and protect our innocent, our, our families. But we have to know that we've been through with worse. With worse. We've been through enemies like this. 
בכל דר ודר אין דם עלינו לחלסנו, והקדוש ברוך הוא מצילנו מי אדם. God saved us from them all. And we have to continue fighting the spiritual war, everyone in their way. Especially the mitzvahs like Tfilin and Mezuzah and Zdoka and Avitz Yisrael and Avitz Yisrael that promote and advance Shmir, protection, and spread it with others. Are we doing a perfect job? No, are we, no, no, no I don't think we're just thinking of a perfect job. But if you haven't feel you haven't done enough, do more. That's the Rebbe's approach. Not to beat ourselves up, not to look at how bad we are. Do we have total achdus? No. But remember, you're either part of the problem or you're part of the solution. What are you doing about it? That's what you have to ask yourself. That's what I have to ask myself. How do we address the divisiveness that still exists between us? Well, in your own small, starting with Elam Katan Za'odam, in your own small little world, in microcosm, Repair whatever you can. You have someone that you haven't spoken to in a while. Get over your pride. Call them. Ask for forgiveness. Mend any rifts. Even if it's not that extreme. And that you have, you can always add an office to It's not always because you're dealing with a negative. Another chesidosh fabring and host something in your home. You can do it online or social media. Promote achdus. There are many, many ways to do it. Start a class. Reach out to people at work. Everyone in their sphere of influence. Some of us can reach more people, by all means. Maybe start a WhatsApp chat. Call Achdus in some way. Or call it whatever original name you like. Invite people to share good thoughts, good feelings, a song, a picture. I mean, there are many, many ways to be, the key is to be proactive. That's how you do things. You don't just wait to be proactive in this regard. Okay. What is the best way to pray for our success? Well, prayer is, is we, every day we have the three tefillahs, Shabbos 4, Yom Kippur 5, Shabbos and Yonta 4, and those prayers are meant to ask for our needs, including the needs for peace, the needs for Shalom, the need for health, the need to be protected, in a way that we don't have a problem in the first place. And if there is, to be healed. Prayers for the hostages, prayers for the soldiers. It's all part of our prayer system. Can we accomplish getting Hashem to agree to release the remaining hostages by saying the simple prayer of the farmer boy, Kukuriku, famous story of Baal Shem Tov? Remember that story was to, to show how the simplicity and tmimus and innocence of a child who doesn't know how to daven pierce the heavens even more than all the tefillahs of the tzaddikim. But you don't see the next year, Rosh Hashanah, that all the Tamidi Hashem started saying kukuriku. That came from that sincere place. So what do we learn from that? Yes, sincerity. From your heart. Rachman Libaboy, boy, from your heart. So it's not, it's not knocking tefillah. It's just saying sometimes your structured prayers, your robotic prayers even, your mechanical prayer, not to say that Sadiqim had that, but the real innocence of a child, in this case the shepherd boy, the, the farm boy, pierced through. So we need that as well. Okay. So a few more questions. Someone asks, and then we'll, uh, any other questions, I'll leave for later. Are we allowed to put the Pulsa Denura curse on governments and officials that are siding with the Hamas terrorists and enabling them? So Pulsa Denura <laughs> is an expression from the Gemara, from Chazal, about the fiery the fiery river, but spiritually speaking, it's like uh, putting a negative energy, a negative curse. The Rebbe told us, Tomim Tim Hashem Alekecha, go the right straight path. We don't look to put curses, we don't look to do anything that is outside of the ordinary. Yes, fight the wars. And outside the ordinary should be Kavona with Teda Mitzvah and Tfila. So, 
if there's some Kabbalists out there that are legitimate, want to put a pulse in the nude, I'm not here to tell them. Someone is shy, like they say, those that know don't say, and those that say don't know. So fine, but I don't think it's something we should be advocating and sitting here and figuring out how to post the Dunuda. Become a better Yid, more Yid Shemayim, more Aves Hashem, more, more Aves Yisrael, more kindness, more Teira Mitzvahs, more Kavonim, more Davening. That's the way. And do it passionately and do it with the real seriousness. That's the path that we take. The same thing with other, I get many suggestions. People come up with all kinds of interesting, strange suggestions as well. So I'm going to read them, not right now, but it's not for right now. Someone, for example, I'll read one more. About becoming a Nazir. It was the week of Pasha Nazir. Can becoming a Nazir help the situation, somebody wrote. If someone in our community takes a vow not to cut their hair or drink wine for 30 days, will they get supernatural strength and then be able to walk into Gaza and safely rescue the hostages and then wreak havoc on on Hamas so they can never again attack us? Or did these occurrences only happen 3,000 years ago and these parts of the Torah are no longer relevant to us? They're relevant to us, Baruchnis, but we don't do that. First of all, being a Nazi is a whole thing and it's not so simple. And even if, yes, someone who's shaykht it, can it help? Perhaps. But it's not our job to become a shimshuna gibber. As I said, our kayach ain't eiz ela teira. Lei bekeich v'lei bechayel ela beruach, spirit. And there's many ways to fight the spiritual war. The Rebbe gave us the mitzvahim, encouraged the mitzvahim. And as I said, all the other mitzvahs that we're talking about, and many others, there's so many ways you can fight the war. That's what we should be doing. I just want to add back to the question of Pulsa Denuda, somebody qualified, the writer wrote, please don't sidestep the question and answer that it's not our job to defeat our enemies by cursing them, and we have to rely only on Hashem to protect us. If that were true, then we shouldn't have an IDF to protect us. We should rely only on Hashem. If the Zerah gives us tools to use to protect ourselves, then why shouldn't we use them? That's not what I said. I said the tools, we were told what the tools are. It didn't say just wait for Hashem. Teirah mitzvahs, tomim tim Hashem alikecha. We spoke about There's a whole bunch of directions that Taylor tells us what to do. Putting on film, Yoram in Mecca. And Mezuzah and so on. So that's uh, the response to that. Okay. Now. There's more questions, but I want to conclude because time is of uh, limited. Should we welcome the news that our enemies are fighting with each other? We'll do a few more. I see a little more time. Okay. It seems civil war has broken out in Gaza between terrorist factions of Hamas and the powerful Abu Amra terrorist clan. May both sides be victorious. This is reminiscent of the civil war in Mitzrayim, the Makkah Mitzrayim B'Vcherehem, between the firstborn and the Mitzrayim during Makkah's B'Cheres, where the firstborn rose against Mitzrayim. Back then, the next step was Geulah's Mitzrayim. Should we be excited that probably now it means the next step is the final Geulah? I sure hope so. And let them destroy each other exactly right. So we definitely can learn that lesson. The Rebbe did mention many times that whenever... Unfortunately, the Jews, Israel, <laughs> was ready to make a mistake or a compromise. Hashem helped that the enemies di- didn't accept it or they began fighting with each other. So that's how we have to look at it. Is it something we should be waiting for? There are many things we need to be doing. Obviously, the more confused they are and the more they fight with each other, the better it is. So I think that's a given and doesn't require much elaboration. So in that spirit, should we celebrate the defeat or death of our enemies? Are we allowed to celebrate that the racist Hamas supporting anti-Semite Jamal Bowman Yamach Shemay lost the election and will be booted out of Congress? I invited some friends over to say L'chaim, but my wife feels we were inappropriate and shouldn't do anything, do any celebrating while Israel is at war. But I feel voting out a rabid anti-Semite is a big step toward winning the war and restoring peace 
in Israel and around the world. So, so this course was celebrating. So who's right, my wife or me? I, look, it says, if evil al tismach. The fall of your enemy, you don't celebrate. Does this apply to the situation? The question is why, why not? Why don't you celebrate? Because our focus is always on non poly yamamanan, to bring light. The fact that we have to fight an enemy, we cry over that. That's sad. We do it because we have to do it, because you have to defend yourself. But we're not celebrating their deaths. We would rather the whole thing never happened. So I think it's not about celebrating. I, I think your wife is right in the sense where I wouldn't bake a whole party out of it. Inside your heart, you want to thank Hashem that this person, this anti-Semite, did not get elected, etc. Or other times when our enemies fall. So there are ways I think it has to be done with discretion and more quietly than loudly. Which brings us to a few other questions that I had a few weeks ago. If you remember when the president of Iran and, uh, the, and the foreign minister were killed, are we allowed to celebrate the death of our enemy, the president of Iran, or should we be worried that his successor might be even worse than him? As it says, a new pharaoh arose that didn't remember Yosef and was more evil than the previous pharaoh. Are we allowed to feel bad that the president of Iran was killed in a helicopter accident? Not to feel bad about him, but to feel bad for the innocent trees that were destroyed when his helicopter crashed into them. Okay. Well, I think the same, pro- the same idea. Obviously, when an enemy falls, we have less threat. But as you said correctly, Iran is not still gone. They still have plenty of enemies. And thank God, Hashem protected us. Or Hashem destroyed one of the enemies, however it happened. But it has to be more subdued, especially when there's a war falling, a war raging, and they're innocent, our soldiers are falling, God forbid, or can't fall. So I think it has to be done everything with a certain measure of humility and, as I said, discretion. Not everything has to be done with fireworks and all the, and make a barbecue out of it. Okay. I want to conclude, even though I like to always conclude on a positive note, I'll co- I always conclude on a positive note, but here's a question that just came in about a book. As usual, I don't like to mention names. I'm not going to mention any names. But I think those that know what it's talking about, but it's a concept, and I am here not to talk, I don't personalize. Talk about the concept, see this applied. And the question that was asked is, should we ban a book that has a negative article about the Rebbe? So, again, without names, a a person purchased a book, and he calls it a masterpiece. The photos are moving, and the essays are inspirational and raw. I walked away with a new appreciation for the Rebbe. But in WhatsApp groups, I received messages that it is a bomb in my house and I need to burn the book. One message wrote that the author should be banned. The stores remove, should remove the book from the shelves. Does this mean I need to remove it from my home? Should I not let my kids read it? Thank you. So, look, for a Chabad Chassid, and even at a Chabad Chassid, there's a thing called respect. You publish a book about the Rebbe, especially in connection to Gimel Tammuz or whatever it may be. You want to positive, positive things. Why would you publish an article that's a critique? Or by someone who's known to be a critic and mavaza and embarrass the Rebbe in public and so on. So obviously we all upset when someone does that. If someone in the secular world does it, you have no control, but we have control. So that would be regarding the author's responsibility. As an author I know, there's a great responsibility. The Rebbe says, Tfuses Ladatus. You print something, it's for generations. So why print something like that as a chassid? I understand someone would say, not as a chassid. You know, the world wants to see both sides. You talk pro Rebbe, and you have someone that has another opinion. But that's not something that we have to initiate being a chassid. On the other hand, the simple approach would be is to encourage the author to re-release the book and even help him do so without that article. That would seem to be the right thing to do. So when I see suddenly it turns into a witch hunt, burning the books, banning it and so on, in many ways, number one, it can feed it even more because people love, love controversy. And then I think to myself, who has an agenda? Maybe someone has an agenda here. We all know what it says in Chassidus, that sometimes a person dresses up his argument, kav yochel, in teira and Chassidus. Yerushamayim, is the Rebbe's COVID. Burn the book. 
ban and excommunicate the author. If you really care so much, why don't you get him to get the, take the article out and preserve the book as a good book? So you start thinking, is there a comp- someone is this competing with someone that doesn't like the book because he has another book that he wants that to- but people are not going to admit that. So address someone. As soon as I hear this extreme reaction, you right away wonder where it's coming from. It could that it's I'm not arguing that the catalyst for it can be a negative thing. But why are you jumping on the, on, the, on the bandwagon of punishing this person? Let him do tshuva if, if that's what you feel he needs. So this is not in any way condoning it, but it's also not condoning this critique that go, takes on extremes. And we all know people, human beings are human beings, and people have agendas, and they're not always pure agendas. I'm not here to criticize anyone here. Just look on the mana inyan. That's what I would suggest to encourage him to remove this article. So say it costs money, fine. So maybe these books can be called back and you put out a new edition without that article. If you really care, that's what you would do. Calling it a bomb and so on and so forth. That's like going a little far. And I don't think anyone has the authority to make such statements. Even if this article is inappropriate, and I say it is, so I think we need to have that type of discretion. Unfortunately, I see constantly this type of approach. Someone does something wrong, and the other side goes equally extreme, and then you left, anyone thinks, any sensible person is left, what am I going to do now? We talked before about Trump and Biden. Similar. Always extremes. Why do we have to go to extremes? Life is not black and white. There's a gray area. So if something that's wrong, correct it, and move on. And be positive. Always be positive. You never know. A writer is a writer. You want him to write. He's going to write fewer, further books. You don't want people to start digging in, creating enemies for no reason. I'm not saying we have to be in any way concerned about someone else's reaction, but it's just a balanced approach. And I hope you agree with me with this. To me, this is the Rebbe's approach to things. So, with that said, and I'm not minimizing the need to protect the Rebbe's COVID. That's not at all what we're talking about. I think that's pretty clear. But it's about really the balance of how to approach something. So in many ways to solve it in a good ways and positive ways. With that, let us conclude. This has been My Life Chassidus Supplied. We're here every Sunday, 8 to 9 p.m. We're going to Chavches Sivan, the day that Rebbe came to America 83 years ago. We honor that day with, together with the Rebbetson by continuing and growing and intensifying our activities of transforming Chatzik Kadra Tachten with Teda and Chassidus until the point of Molot is Deus Hashem Kamayim Layom Achasim. Today, with all the tools we have and instruments and technologies, we have the ability to do so. Next week will be a special Gimel Tamas edition. It's 30 years, which is mixed feelings. I don't even call it, we're not honoring 30 years, we're not celebrating 30 years, but it is 30 years. So we'll talk about that as well. My Life Chassidus Supplied, please go to chassidusupplied.com where you could submit all these questions, any question you may have, as well as offer, it offers you many resources in Chassidus and explanations and tools. Everyone be blessed to be, again, a good, a good Chedish Tamas as well. And a Freilchen Chav Ches Sivan. This program is brought to you by My Life, Chassidus Applied. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at chassidusapply.com slash donate.